Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute podcast. I'm your host, Rowena Itchon. Recently, PRI and the Institute for Humane Studies joined forces to put on an energy conference in Vancouver, Canada. PRI Senior Fellow Wayne Weingarten was the MC and moderator. One of our special guests was Marlo Lewis, a Senior Fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute who writes on global warming, energy policy, and other public policy issues. Marlo sat down with Tim Anaya, PRI's Director of Communications, and me for a wide-ranging discussion on environmental and energy issues in the state. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's podcast, Marlo. Thank you, Rowena. California is known as a home of the Trump resistance. California policymakers and Attorney General Javier Becerra have been working overtime opposing the Trump administration's efforts to bring some free market balance to the heavy-handed Obama-era policies. One lawsuit filed by Becerra and others seeks to overturn Scott Pruitt's decision to revise the Obama administration's fuel economy standards. Why is this a meritless lawsuit, in your view? When California and its 16 allies and the District of Columbia so a team of 18 filed this suit. I took a look at it and I wrote something about it in op-ed that week. And I called it meritless because in order for a lawsuit to even be considered by a court in the United States, the issue has to be considered right for adjudication. Now there is a law called the Administrative Procedure Act that actually governs regulatory litigation. And that's what this is about. It's a lawsuit challenging a some sort of regulatory decision or determination. And it's and, and this law, the Administrative Procedure Act, very plainly states that an agency action must be final before someone can sue to overturn it. And so in this lawsuit, the Cal- California and its allies are very careful to describe it as a final action. But it is anything but a final action. That's why I thought this thing was so ridiculous. There is There's actually s- several Supreme Court cases that deal with the criteria by which you determine whether an agency action is final or not. But there are two main ones. And one is that the action is actually a consummation of a decision-making process. So so it actually comes to a final decision. And secondly, that it has some effect on legal obligations and rights of the various parties who might be affected by the regulation. All right. Well, in this case, all Scott Pruitt, the administrator of EPA, decided to do was to initiate a rulemaking at a future time. All right. So this is not even really the first step in revising the Obama administration's standards. It's just a decision to do that in the future. And far from Scott Pruitt and the EPA having finalized that rulemaking, he hasn't even proposed it yet. All right, so that's number one. The other is that in the decision at some future date to to initiate a rulemaking to to consider whether it is appropriate to revise these uh, standards, and if so, then to, to propose that they be revised in such a way, it says specifically that in the interim, between now and then, the Obama rules shall remain in effect so that none of the rights and obligations of any of the stakeholders, not the auto industry, not states that participate in, in these regulations, none of their rights and obligations shall be effected until end of the rulemaking process when a new rule is final. So that's why I thought this was completely an empty suit. So you wrote a piece recently in the San Francisco Chronicle of all places, arguing that fuel economy standards aren't really that effective in the fight against global warming. How so? Make your case to our listeners. This is a case that has actually been made by the Obama administration agencies, the Obama EPA and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. It was actually in their big rulemaking of 2012 that established greenhouse gas and fuel economy standards all the way out to the year 2021. The current controversy has to do with the later years, 2022 to 2025, because one of those agencies simply does not have the authority to set standards that far in advance. But nonetheless, they so they had a schedule of standards that would become increasingly stringent from 2016 through 2025. This, this they decided on in 2012, and they estimated what the impacts would be on global warming in the year 2100. And it was just a few hundredths of a degree. I mean, it 
would be barely, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even be detectable. It was so small. I mean, and it, it might, you know, avert uh, a few millimeters of sea level rise, but no one could tell because sea levels fluctuate by well more than that from year to year. So, so that was, that was, I think, the, the, the main part of this, this, uh, the main part of their, their problem in selling this as a global warming remedy because the amount of global warming that would re- be reduced between now and 2100, because it is so small, it would not probably be detectable even by scientific instruments then, would have no conceivable, detectable, verifiable, measurable impact on things people really care about, like weather patterns, crop yields, polar bear uh, populations, you know, so this was all symbolism without substance. California has been on the forefront in trying to play car salesman and encouraging motorists to buy expensive zero emission vehicles and offering very generous taxpayer funded subsidies. Our Wayne Weingarten, who is a PRI senior fellow in business and economics, has written that these subsidies are just giveaways to the rich. What's your view? Should government be pushing us to buy electric cars? No, government should not be pushing us to buy electric cars. Uh, Government has no business trying to shape consumer preferences. Uh, These are private matters. And Wayne is absolutely right. Uh, The vast majority of these tax credits, which are very generous, there's a federal tax credit of $7,500 for buying an electric car. California has uh, tax credits that are equally high. Several states have credits of $4,000 and and up and so on. The vast majority of those are scarfed up by people like Hollywood movie stars and Silicon Valley billionaires. And that is that is entirely the case that a lot of these, uh, most of the beneficiaries of these tax credits are what are called free riders. They're people who would buy the vehicle anyway, people like Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, um, and they really don't need the, the tax write-off. And the, uh, the, the one of the big problems here is that California, for years, has decided that it, that they somehow have um, um, a mission from, from God, maybe, I don't know, but to electrify America's motor vehicle marketplace. They actually promulgated a rule back in the 1990s, the California Air Resources Board, requiring that 10% of all new vehicles sold in California be electric vehicles by when? By the year 2000. And 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 as you know, I mean, they, they, they have come nowhere near close to that even now as they're approaching the year 2020. But they think that if they if their reach constantly exceeds their grasp, that this somehow shows how virtuous they are. In other words, the more unrealistic they get, the, they, they think that makes them somehow greener. And you see a lot of this in, in European climate policy as well. Every time they miss the, 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 the last targets that they pledge to meet, their, their solution is to pledge even more unattainable targets next year or, or five years later. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, because the costs of climate policy are very real, to a great extent it has become an exercise in virtue signaling. So another lawsuit that our Attorney General Becerra has filed is over the Trump administration's efforts to cancel the Obama administration's clean power plan. And for our listeners that aim to reduce power plant emissions, PRI did a study on that plan and found that it actually would increase energy poverty in California and across the country. You've written that the clean power plan was a power grab and its repeal would actually benefit all Americans. So how so and what's your view on how these court cases will turn out? I'm very hopeful about the court cases because Clean Power Plan was a power grab, which is to say it was a, an illegal overreach by the, the EPA under the Obama administration. The, the EPA tried to take a three-sentence provision of the Clean Air Act, Section 111D, that had only been used a total of five times in 40 years to regulate uh, a handful of, um, of stationary facilities, basically five regulations to re- regulate four different gases that, that, that couldn't possibly be addressed by other provisions of the act. And it, it was so, it became so underused that the last time the EPA promulgated one of these rules, under one of these five rules under the under this provision was in 1996. Basically, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments made this provision obsolete because any dangerous pollute from a stationary source that you needed to control, you could do under the hazardous air pollute provision of the Clean Air Act, which was dramatically expanded in 1990 so that it it addressed 189 named pollutants. And the EPA 
had the obligation to go to, to categories, categorize every industrial facility in the United States and, uh, if, they, um, uh, if they were sources of any of these 189 pollutants. There really wasn't anything left to do under 111D. But, and here's the thing, this particular provision says that if the EPA has established perf- what are called performance standards for new sources in an industrial category, it could be, you know, chemical uh, manufacturing facilities, it, it could be aluminum smelters, okay, anything like that, then it would have to come up with performance standards for what are called existing sources, which would be something that's already been built. All right. But the standards would have to reflect what are called a best system of emission reduction. Uh, that's That's been adequately demonstrated. And so then the question is, okay, what is a best system of emission reduction for power? Um, anyway, the thing is that the, that the EPA under this provision is supposed to establish performance standards for sources, what are called sources. And a source is very carefully defined in the Clean Air Act under the, in this very provision as a building structure, facility, or installation that either emits air pollutants or has the potential to emit air pollutants. And so that means that whatever the best system of emission reduction is upon which the standards are supposed to be set, it has to be something that can be applied to a source, to a particular building, structure, facility, or installation. Well, EPA didn't want to be bound by that limitation because there really is no technological system for reducing carbon dioxide emissions from power plants, all you might be able to do is tell the plant to run a little bit more efficiently so that it would burn a little less fuel for every kilowatt that it produced. But that would do nothing to accomplish what EPA really wanted to do, what Obama really wanted to do, which was to shift the whole U.S. electric power system away from fossil fuels toward renewables. So what did EPA do? It it, it established standards that no individual coal or natural gas power plant can meet. In other words, there's no technology or modification you can make to a coal power plant or a natural gas power plant that will meet the standards in the clean power plant. Basically, if they tried to do it, they'd all go broke. So what did the EPA decide? Well, actually, we're going to conceive of the entire U.S. electric grid. where The whole North American electric power sector is really one big machine. And so these individual units can comply by shifting generation from themselves to renewable. So it was this crazy cockamamie scheme. It was the worst kind of results-oriented um, regulation. And it is simply unlawful because a an electric power sector, a grid ba- a grid connected industry, an interdependent, you know, marketplace of producers is not a source under the Act. A source under the Act is an individual building, facility, structure, or installation. And EPA tried to establish standards based on the conceit, you know, a creature of their imagination, that source can mean an an entire industrial sector, an interconnected marketplace, so that the actual sources, which are the individual power plants, are are reimagined as mere cogs in a machine. This is so outrageous. It is so preposterous. I don't see how it survives judicial review. Thanks to our guest, Marla Lewis of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and to my colleague, Tim Anaya. To find out more about Marla Lewis's work at CEI, visit CEI.org. Also, don't forget to check out PRI's website at our blog, Right by the Bay, at PacificResearch.org. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash PacificResearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Marina Ishan. We hope you'll come back again for another episode of PRI's podcast.